Hi, welcome to A Grey Barn Rising. I'm here this evening, of course, with Bootsy Beagle, and I'm reading the poems of the French poet Francis Panja. He's a really incredible poet of great scene and great attention. He lived from 1899 to 1988, and he perfected the prose poem, and a prose poem of looking at the world of natural things, especially the world of objects, sometimes animals, but really looking at many things that are inanimate and in the process of looking so deeply and with such deep attention, animating them in tremendous ways. The interesting thing to me about Francis Panja's work is it's just as much about language as it is about the things that he sees. There's this incredible transparency of the words and the metaphors that he uses to represent the things that he sees. And he really thins the membrane between the seer and the seen. He really diminishes the distance between I and thou, or the observer and the observed. Sometimes the language is seemingly almost scientific, but it never lapses into pure objectivism in that way. There's a tenderness and a deep regard with which the poet sees the world and represents the world in intimate detail, in really precise imagery in detail, but without ever imposing upon the object the poet's ego. The poet is, does not approach the outer world, the world of things, as, say, a romantic poet might, imposing sometimes upon the natural world the inner feelings of the observer. Panja tries to maintain a kind of transparency in which he's actually looking at the world, the natural world, in ways that then do not colonize it, do not appropriate that world, but try to let the natural world be itself. For me, the phrase that really epitomizes his work is the title of a book of his from which I will not be reading this evening, but it's, it's a marvelous title, Mute Objects of Expression. Mute Objects of Expression. And this really epitomizes for me what uh, he does in reanimating the world of things. I have many of Panja's books. There's that book, of course. There's the Selected Poems. Um, his book, Soap. Wonderful little book called Vegetation. The Red Dust Books. I'm going to be reading, however, primarily from two of my favorite books and favorite translations, primarily his early poems. Uh, in uh, the nature of things. And I'd like to begin by reading from Ten Poems of Francis Panja, translated by Robert Bly. And these also include ten of Bly's poems, but I'm going to be reading only the poems of, of the French poet Panja. I'd like to begin with the very first poem of his that I ever encountered. Um, it just completely blew me away. I came to this poem in 1980. So many years ago, and it really invigorated my desire to see the world of things much more deeply as well. It's called The Delights of the Door. Kings don't touch doors. They don't know this joy. To push affectionately or fiercely before us one of those huge panels we know so well. Then to turn back in order to replace it. Holding a door in our arms. The pleasure of grabbing one of those tall barriers to a room abdominally by its porcelain knot. Of this swift fighting body to body when the forward motion for an instant halted, the eye opens and the whole body adjusts to its new surroundings. But the body still keeps one friendly hand on the door, holding it open, then decisively pushes the door away, closing itself in, which the click of the powerful but well-oiled spring pleasantly confirms. That, to me, typifies a Panja poem, where he looks at something that 
of course we look at doors, but do we really examine them with that kind of detail? We often look at a door as a barrier, as a door as something we simply pass through as we move from one space to another. I love that he puts his attention there. Another of my favorite poems of his is entitled, The Candle. Night at times revives a curious plant whose light makes powerfully furnished rooms fall apart into clumps of shadow. Its gold leaf stands unmoved, attached to the hollow of a small column of alabaster by a pure black leaf stalk. The seedy moths attack it rather than attacking the too high moon that turns the woods to mist. But scorched in an instant or overstrained in the skirmish, they all tremble on the brink of a mania close to stupor. The candle, meanwhile, by the way its rays flicker on the book as it suddenly discharges its original gases, urges the reader on, then bends over onto its plate and drowns in what has always fed it. Language, as I said for Panja, attains a transparency and part of that is that he moves not simply in the world of description and even the world of image, but in the world of metaphor. So that language becomes one of the things that the poems are actually talking about. The ability to lang for language to describe and attain a description, but also the limitations of that. The oyster. The oyster about as large as a medium-sized stone, has a rougher look and a less consistent color, whitish in a dazzling way. It is a world bullheadedly sealed. You can open it, however. You must hold it then in the deep fold of a napkin. Use a knife notched and not too honest and try more than once. Fingers that are curious cut themselves, break their nails. It's not an elegant task. The knocks you give it leave whitish rings on the shell, halos of some kind. Once inside, you will find an entire world for drinking and for eating. Beneath a firmament, to speak properly, of mother of pearl, the upper heavens slowly approach the lower heavens, making what is really only a pool, a viscous and greenish pillow that rises and falls as you smell and look, decorated at the edges with a fringe of blackish lace. Occasionally, it is rare, a beautiful expression rises in their mother of pearl throats, and you find good reason then to adorn yourself. The frog. It's interesting. Panja will talk about the um, the flora, and in his poems, and they they. And maintain a kind of firmness to them, but he'll also talk about the fauna of the world, and they maintain a, have a different kind of dynamism to them. So there's also this stillness and movement that goes back and forth throughout his poems. The Frog. When rain like metal tips bounces off the sodden pastures, an amphibious dwarf, an Ophelia with empty sleeves, barely as large as a fist, rises at times from around the poet's feet and then hurdles herself into the nearest pool. Let this nervous one flee. How beautiful her legs are. A glove impermeable to water envelops her body. 
barely flesh at all. Her long muscles and their elegance are neither animal nor fish. In order to escape from my fingers, the virtue of fluid allies in her with the battle of the life force. She puffs widely goitered, and this heart that beats so strongly, the wrinkly eyelids, the old woman's mouth, move me to set her free. I'd like to turn now to a little-known translation of his work, The Nature of Things. And this book was translated by Lee uh, Fainestock, and it came out from a small press, Red Dust Books. And I think the translations here are, are just marvelous. So I'd like to read um, first the poem, The Cigarette. First, let's set the atmosphere. Hazy yet dry, wispy with the cigarette always placed right in the thick of it, once engaged in its continuous creation. Then, the thing itself, a small torch, far more perfumed than illuminating, from which, in a number of small heaps set within a chosen rhythm, ashes work free and fall. Finally, its sacrifice, the glowing tip scaling off in silvery flakes, while a tight muff formed of most recent ash encircles it. I wanted to read that poem in part because it has the line, then the thing itself. And in many ways, that's, that's what uh, Paja's poems approach and try to render it most dear detail. The Mollusk. The Mollusk is a being, almost a quality. It has no need for a framework, but only a rampart something like paint in a tube. Here, nature foregoes a display of protoplasm in good form, yet it demonstrates its affection by painstakingly sheltering the thing in a jewel case whose inner face is the more beautiful. So it is not merely a glob of spit, but a most precious reality. The mollusk is endowed with powerful energy to close itself in. To tell the truth, it is simply a muscle, a hinge, a door latch, and its door. A latch that secreted the door. Two slightly concave doors constitute its entire abode. First and last abode. It resides there till after its death. There's no way to get it out alive. Every last cell in a human body clings in the same way and with the same vigor to words, reciprocally. But at times, some other creature comes along and violates this sepulcher when it's well made and settles there place of its late builder. Take the hermit crab, for instance. <laughs> I, just, I just love and adore the closing to that poem. It seems so much like it's setting up a, a further example that the poem is going to continue. It's just it's such a wonderful way to close a poem, such an unexpected way. Take the hermit crab, for instance. And this also typifies the almost informal quality of these poems. While they maintain quite a formal quality to them, formal in the sense that they're observing in really specific detail. And I love the, the tension and complexity that those discourses, different discourses within a single poem, 
provide. Let me close then with a poem from this same collection called Bread. Bread. The crust on a loaf of French bread is a marvel, first off, because of the almost panoramic impression it gives, as though one had the Alps, the Taurus Range, or even the Andean Cordillera right in the palm of the hand. In that light, an amorphous belching mass was slipped into the stellar oven on our behalf. And there, while hardening, it molded into valleys, ridges, foothills, rifts. And from then on, all those clearly articulated plains, all the wafer-thin slabs where light takes care to bank its rays without a thought for the disgraceful mush beneath the surface. That cold, soggy substratum, the doughy innards, consists of a sponge-like tissue. There, flowers, leaves are fused together at every bend like Siamese twins. When the bread grows stale, the flowers wither and shrink. They come apart from one another, and the whole thing goes to crumbs. But let's cut short here, for bread should be mouthed less as an object of respect than of consumption. There's a beautiful parable-like quality to that poem and to many of Ponge's poems uh, that I, I just find so fascinating and, and um, so attractive in his work. So again, I read from The Nature of Things, from Red Dust Books, and also Ten Poems of Francis Ponge. Trans this was translated by Robert Bly. As I showed you earlier, he has many books and others that I don't even have here with me this evening. So I hope you seek out his work. He, it's very instructive also in such a way for poets to learn to get out of their heads a little bit and to move into the world of objects and animals and to try to inhabit that world that one sees much more fully. Thank you so much for joining Bootsy and me for another episode of A Great Bar.